should be actually ready to join now. Before we win, whatever it is. So do you think? So. Uh, do I look at this? So let's have a look. I'm here. We'll share and I've got I'm not muted. Yeah, so you should be in. Not hearing anything, are you? Are they talking at the moment? No, because uh, I'm in there. And I'm not muted. Everything's good. Yeah, it should be okay. John White's in there. It says only two of us here. Yeah, okay. So I should be just, uh, well, I'll leave my, I'll leave my, yeah, uh, so it should, should work. You're in and ready. Just I'm in and ready. Ready to go as far as no, yeah. <laughs> Famous words. I think so. Hello. If all goes. As far as no, that's everything. Your, your screen is shared already, so. Then you just want to all share your screen. Let's back up to the stop share and it's back to your video. Uh, but I want to share it. Yeah, you do. No, it's just if you want to get rid of it, you just go to the red one over there. So I'm happy. I'm, yeah. I really should. I should just, as soon as I arrive, I should be fine. Yeah, I think so. Well, I'll yell at you. Yeah. <laughs>
we talked about where the money was, so unpacking the funding. Then we moved on to grant applications and increasing your chances to get that funding. But I think we all could agree, we, we appear to be moving into a stage of recovery. Uh, so building that business resilience and continuity planning is vitally important uh, at the moment. We're fortunate to have Stuart Moore, uh, the CEO, one of the co-founders of EarthCheck, come on and present to us today. We work quite a lot with Stuart and he's been an absolute wealth of knowledge, knowledge on a whole range of subjects, but I think he'll have great value for you all here today. Some of you may be noticing that your cameras and things have been turned off. Jackie Burnside in the background is, is uh, subtly turning off everyone's uh, videos and uh, microphones just because it aids uh, the presenting, but also for people in areas of poor internet connectivity, we have found that they can hear better if your video is turned off. So, Tim, we're going to turn that video off, mate. I know we've all seen you before, buddy. You're a good looking rooster, but we're just going to have to take an hour looking at the still photo. So without any further ado, I'll pass over to Stuart Moore and he'll uh, lead the session. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Michael. Look, it's my absolute pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. Uh, we can make this pretty light and bright. Michael's going to keep me honest. So if there's questions, he's going to bring them into the forum so we can discuss them. And hopefully I'll break right throughout the hour we've got where, so that we actually can stop and talk about any of the issues that, that are particularly been of interest to you. What I've done is I've break the presentation into... So Stuart, before you go any further, so I did mean to say this, and I think Jack just put it there. If you would like to submit a question at any time during the presentation, please do so through the chat function. I will then combine, if we've got like for like questions or similar themes, and then I'll choose a time to interject with Stuart if, he's, if it's relevant to that part of the presentation. But that's the best way to submit a question through the chat function down the bottom of the navigation. Ah, that's it for the last interruption. Go. Thank you. And look, that chat function is fantastic because it means that uh, your comments are maintained and we'll pick them up as we progress. So look, what I'm going to start just looking at the whole issue of crisis management, which is where we're at now. Um, that's a global uh, protocol. Um, and there are, it actually is four steps as PPRR, but we'll look at three steps today, more focused on recovery. I'm going to look at the three phases of COVID-19 planning and share some perspectives with you on what timing sits in front of us. And Michael and Jack can give us some heads up because every day this changes in terms of um, what timing and the opening of um, our gateways and also social distancing. And then we're going to have a deep dive and look at the six the steps of COVID-19. And there are templates there I'm going to share with you and I can leave with you to basically fold into your own business plans as they're evolving. I'm gonna put key messages up front, but you know, most importantly, I'd like to finish with destination opportunities because we will come out of this crisis and we really need to be starting to think about what industry we want to be in front of us and where we sit um, as operators and as destinations. And hopefully we'll spend some time on discussions and questions. So ultimately, when we look at um, crisis management, the international protocol is about prevention. It's about being prepared and having a business impact analysis, having a response plan and a recovery. My focus today is very much on the preparation, response and recovery side of it. Um, so by default, I've pretty much uh, summarised that into three key steps where we're at now, which is an understanding of, of in fact, what risk we face minimising that risk, um, preparing a response, uh, and we've got three stages to walk you with in terms of some timing sequences, uh, an immediate and a medium and a long-term, um, but my immediate, medium and long-term really only lasts for 18 months. So I think we've got to be really realistic about how far uh, forward we can think. And then I guess, have a look at what's the new normal that's going to lay in front of us. And that's going to be an interesting one because it changes uh, daily. So if we look at um, the three steps or phases, we're currently in containment and crisis management. So you can call that many things, but from an operator's perspective, that's basically about survival. And I've got some case studies for you today, and I've been working with a number of the operators in region to talk about how they've actually uh, uh, embraced the whole context of containment in their operational features of their business. Then we've got a medium term stage recovery. And we know that recovery is going to be domestic driven uh, and that's 
already started with some social distancing being reduced and also we've got to start mapping out what that means for our gateways and then longer term what's going to be the norm new normal and i've got a timeline i'm going to share with you in a moment when we look at the COVID response uh, platform there are six key steps these actually are sourced from work that's just been done for these by the australian tourism industry council all of the banks actually have very good uh, platforms too but they start out with assessing the current situation at a business level and we'll look at some case studies about what that means building your business continuity plan that plan by default means we have to start factoring in your financial and your cash flows and human resource management there'll be implications for operational recovery and we'll finish with some comments on marketing and communications but we'll keep it fairly light and bright um, I would like to recognise, and I'm going to share all of these with uh, Michael and Jackie. It's built on a lot of the information that I've tried to, to bring together for you across Australia, in fact, across the globe at the moment. Work that we, we undertake, EarthCheck is a business advisory group that specialises in destination management. And we've been doing risk and resilience workshops um, throughout Australia more recently and, and have developed an app for operators. So, we're going to fold some of that learnings into the, the discussion today. We're, I've got some fantastic work that's been, been happening by 2031 from Canada, um, who do a lot of work in experience development and marketing. All of the big four uh, business and consulting groups have business resilience diagnostics, but I'll share with you through Michael the BDO one, which I think is a really good one to have by your side. I've also included some work by, from Laserfish. They, in fact, are not a tourism operator at all. They don't work in the tourism industry. Uh, they're a company that specialises in IT. I think sometimes it's always good to see another uh, company's or sector's views on what continuity looks like. And then I factored in work that currently is being done by the Queensland Tourism Industry Council and the Australian Industry Council. They're the templates that we're going to work through today. There are a lot of good online um, platforms and uh, a lot of them are webinar series on financial planning. I've actually given a link here for some of the work we're doing in Ireland, but particularly if the Irish government that are looking at cash flow management for nothing else, it gives you another perspective on how other countries are looking at the basic business fundamentals. Um, McKinsey and Co, you're all busy out there just trying to keep your companies alive, but. McKinsey do have some fantastic reading in terms of where we're going to for next steps. And I'll also make sure I start putting in some of the work and some of the case study material from Crystal Castle and also from Jetty Dive. And I've been speaking with Mike uh, and Naren during the week. So what we do know is, and we're entering a period where we're having an easing of restrictions and market access. Uh, it's going to be domestically driven. There'll be a resumption of, of intrastate. And we'll talk a little bit about the implications of that for your regions as for you as operators. It's almost back to the future. It's going back 15 years when the domestic drive market first developed is where it's going to start again. Uh, and then we'll follow a resumption of interstate travel as our borders open between states and territories. And then we'll have a look at resumption of domestic flights, but the expectation is that will happen well into the end of the year and allowed to be a very short number of flights coming online. Uh, I'd include within domestic flights the Tasman trans-Tasman bubble because basically New Zealand will be almost seen like a domestic market uh, when that bubble opens and more particularly that will more likely be next year and then of course the international uh, resumption of international travel, which can be as much as two to three years away. So we've got a lot of hard work to do uh, as an industry and as a nation. So if we look at our indicative timelines, and this is nothing more than an indication of how where I see uh, us moving to, we're already into an easing of some domestic access restrictions. Um, and by default, that's going to be the green, green shoots. Uh, VFR and family, VFR are already, you know, the realms of 30 to 32% of market. So it's going to be locals traveling and particularly locals from Southeast Queensland being your largest target market. Um, and that's going to morph in then to interstate markets um, as the state borders open. There's a lot of work being undertaken across Australia 
on what that drive market's going to look for. So you need to be really mindful of where we're heading for the next six to eight months. And then as I mentioned earlier, there'll be uh, an opening up of domestic air access. We've already lost one airline. It still needs to be recapitalized. So that's going to be very slow to come back and more likely towards the end of the year. And then international, if we're lucky, by quarter three or four next year. And I think that's going to play out. And each of those lines can be moving, the red lines, subject to what happens in front of us. Um, having said that, the easing of domestic uh, access conditions has come about reasonably fast at this stage, even though it differs between states. So let's just go straight to messages. Um, so I guess the first message for everyone in the context of, of risk and crisis management and continuity is, our industry is not going to be the same on the other end. We already know that right throughout Australia, we're going to lose a lot of operators and there are issues that we need to be mindful there from a supply chain perspective. It's not just a matter of you as an operator, but who might be there to support you in either transport or distribution or service. And we also know that our consumer markets, and, and Michael talked about this earlier, they will change in terms of where they can travel to and their expectations for what they want to see and do. And we'll talk about that. I see recovery then as being more of a W formation. It's not going to be linear. So it's not going to be how we'd normally expect recovery and growth for every step forward. Um, so if it's two steps forward, you're going to find a whole range of scenarios where we actually are made to halt and have either one step backwards or to the side. And so we need to be Fundamentally, part of our con continuity planning is contingency planning on what will happen. And it's already happening in Germany and Europe as they open up borders where we see some clusters start to arrive. So to a certain extent, everything that we're going to talk about today is about a back to basics business planning. And for those of you who've been in market a long time, and I certainly have been, this takes us right back to the beginning when we started to build tourism in terms of the fundamentals, particularly when we talk about the drive tourism market. And back to basics also, we'll talk about later in terms of the fundamentals of cash flow management, all the things that we know that should underpin our business continuity plans. It'll be domestic led, we've talked about that, local day trips, VFR and family groups, we know that that'll be limited to the 250 Ks, the 250 Ks was the magical distance that was established because that's really what you could do in a day comfortably. Two to three hours in the morning and two to three hours back at night. But we do know that as the borders open and all the states are pushing this, that they're expecting to that to move towards to two to five day trips, which of course will include your overnight stays and extended weekends. So, the expectation that that's going to happen within the next uh, six to eight months with your longer travel options. Um, we know that there'll be domestic, uh, the trans-Tasman bubble will be start to be talked about. I mean, they're already talking about a Tasmanian bubble. So you're going to see throughout the world, and it's already happening in Scandinavia, that different countries will realign. They'll have implications for who comes into market first, particularly for international um, air services. And what do we do know, and Michael did talk about this earlier too, is that market, when it comes back, are going to be seeking reassurance and safety. So health, hygiene and wellbeing are going to be front and centre of travel for a long period of time, both domestically and internationally, as will contingency planning. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so you can have the right hygiene things happening in your operation, but ultimately across our supply chain and within our destinations, the whole supply chain needs to be understanding of their role that they will need to play in terms of hygiene and cleanliness, um, in terms of getting people back to our destinations. We know that uh, there has been real elements of cabin fever. You've got a pent up demand uh, with a lot of people in Southeast Queensland and Northern New South Wales, who, are out, who want to get out now and, and revisit parks and beaches and walks. Uh, we know there'll be a greater, greater awareness of community and sense of place. Um, and particularly a concept we're going to hear a lot more of is localism, fresh food and produce and reconnection. That is not a new theme. It's a theme we talked about at the last major conference um, that was held at, I think, South uh, West Rocks. 
Um, but the reality is they're going to be regional winners and losers right across Australia that we need to be mindful of, as well as operators. So caution will be embedded in destination choice. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and there'll be some time before we will see volume return uh, to market. And that has an implication for everyone in tourism, because even if we did have demand increasing substantially tomorrow, you're not gonna have all your operators in place. And even the operators who are in place need to put staff back on. And there are a whole range of constrictions in yield considerations that we need to determine whether you're an accommodation outlet or you're a restaurant with limited space for people to sit. Or if you're someone like a Mike at Jetty Dive, who can, could no longer use the boats uh, to go out diving, therefore you had to look at an alternative means, which was from shore. You're also going to hear a lot of more of the word of regenerative tourism. And simply regenerative tourism is that the expectation that, yeah, volume of tourism was great for a while, but we'd like to think that we have tourism that gives back to communities. And the Kiwis are doing an enormous amount of work in this and probably, and they are very good at uh, sustainability, will be the market lead in terms of how they would define regenerative tourism uh, in their industry. Obviously, we want all, we'll welcome all visitors back into market, but quite clearly, yield is going to be front and center of mind for all our operators. And there are a whole range of considerations we'll do when we pick up our templates in a moment. Probably one of the issues that um, was we were facing as an industry last year that now comes uh, with us in front of us is insurance. So insurance was a major issue well before uh, COVID-19 with our bushfires and our extreme weather events. We're gonna talk a bit, little bit about that and where that sits in your continuity plans, um, but it needs to be addressed. And we also know that we, as we move forward, need to understand trauma and healing. And you'll hear a lot more about those words, healing at a destination level. It's a key theme that you and WTO, World Tourism Authority are talking about is how we help destinations heal and operators and communities. Um, Industry assistance, and I know you've already had a workshop on funding and grant applications, is going to be critical uh, for the next 12 months. So we're going to need to keep close to the ground with Michael and Jackie on what grants are available in market. And we know that there's going to be a strategic tension that's already started to happen on one hand in fostering and supporting safety, but also trying to drive visitation and growth at a regional level. And in Australia, and this is already happening in Victoria and parts of Queensland, there are a number of local authorities who don't want to welcome people back. And that has a range of implications if you're in the drive market and you happen to be the link to another drive destination. Um, we'll talk about this probably more to conclude, but what we do know is digital needs to underpin our communication channels. I don't know if Naren's with us from Crystal Castle, but we'll talk about his case study where he's been very effective in using his digital and social media when he, he could no longer uh, invite visitors to his attraction. Virtuality is we need to be starting to sell the experience. So I guess being online, the whole idea is that you sell the experience. There is a captive audience there who really wants to travel at some stage. So the eye is see it now and then visit us when you have the opportunity. And we know that we need to review all of our priority markets. And we're gonna talk a little bit about drive market as we progress. So, Pretty much I'm throwing out there what I think to be the key messages um, as we start sort of drilling into crisis management and continuity planning. So it is a roller coaster. Some of you are on this roller coaster now and some of you are heading into the valley. Some of you are actually a uh, fight back, but probably the learning from extreme uh, disasters across the world is we need to work more effectively together as operators to support each other and we need to work more effectively as communities because we will have a long way to go in the context of reconstruction and return. And each of those stages need to have support. Part of the, I guess, uh, opportunity of the resources is that there's some very good resources out there to support people uh, when they need it. So we know there are three elements of, of our business plan. One is about the health and, and safety of our, um, our guests and our staff. We need to be on top of our financial responsibilities, and we'll talk a little bit about 
the context of cash management, but also uh, what are the costs of running your business. And most importantly, it's the reputational uh, platform, not so much just now, but what that's going to mean to invite visitors back to our destinations uh, and our attractions. So just like crisis management, the key issue for us is how fast we can return to a period of response and recovery uh, from crisis. So I'm gonna map that out a little bit for you. And I thought I'd just throw in some positive slides. So the, this is actually research out of the United Kingdom. The research from Tourism Australia is not so different, uh, but what we do know is there are a lot of people who are sitting at home and have been doing so for some time, particularly in large capital cities and regional centres. What do they want to do when they've got the opportunity? 59% do want to go out to restaurants again, 51% want to go out shopping, but most importantly, 45% want to travel. Uh, and one of the opportunities, and this is for the state tourism authorities to review and Tourism Australia is, you have 9 million people from this country who go overseas at regular intervals. So we now have them as a captive audience because they're not going to be able to do that for some period of time. And I put this up at a, my presentation uh, when we were uh, at um, South West Rock some time ago, but ultimately it's not the strongest of the species, nor the most intelligent, but the ones most responsive to change. So all the bits of the discussion today about how responsive we're going to be to our continuity planning moving forward. So there are six parts of the recovery response. Uh, and what I'm going to do is just simply walk you through these templates. They are no more than just templates. They're prompts for you to check against your current business plans. Uh, what we do know is all the major banks uh, and industry associations do have templates that you can be using. I'm just providing this as a prompt for you today in terms of where it fits in your continuity planning. And hopefully I can pick some things up that perhaps you might not have thought of. So it starts with assessing the current situation. Uh, which is really where all our case studies had started, which is uh, I can no longer do certain activities. What are the implications for my business moving forward and what are my options for cash and revenue? Uh, the continuity business plan then needs to be developed. And, and what we do know is if it's a comprehensive plan, your financial analysis and your cash flow planning and your human resource management need to be factored in together. And we'll look at some cases of that. It is about operational recovery on the three phases that I talked about, our timing phases, and about marketing and communi communications to our markets, which also needs to fit into those three phases. So if we look at the first one, not surprisingly, current situation is, and we'll probably use, um, I'll pick on Mike here from Jetty Dive, I don't know Mike's with us, but obviously from his situation, there are certain parts of his business he couldn't maintain. So the first was, the inability to put people uh, into a boat to take them out to dive. Uh, and there's a yield issue there about the limited number of people and the cost of that. Therefore, if you can't do that, what's the impact on the business? What's the impact on your service? What are your contingencies? In his case, the option was coming up with a dive from shore. And we'll talk about that a little bit long after. And I've got some case studies for you. So, that assess the current situation is where you all should be now in the context of what you can't do and what's your fallback. The business continuity plan then simply just picks that up with your financials and starts to factor in, and we'll talk about this in a moment, your staff implications, cash flow in terms of revenue, equipment, particularly in, in terms of leasing. It's, it's those sorts of things that start hurting when we don't have cash coming in, and then coming up with a responsibility for action and more particularly a time frame, which hopefully those, the three cases uh, will give you an indication of. Human resource management is probably the hardest thing that any small business uh, can do because we don't have dedicated human resource managers. So I'll only walk through this once. Uh, later on, when we look at some of the case studies, we'll more look to what the actions were rather than the questions. But I do think it's worthwhile us just simply asking the question. So more particularly, given the analysis of our business in terms of case management, if we can't do certain activities, well, what implication does that have on the people that we employ? If we have to look at uh, additional ways of doing business, 
Are there additional training that needs to be undertaken? What are the roles and responsibilities of the group? And if it's anything like my business, that's changing because we're restructuring as a company and people are taking on different roles and some multi-skilling. Will there be changes to employment conditions? And more particularly, they will be, so they have to be managed. Uh, and you need to actually get good advice on this from your legal and accountant, accountants that you're working with. And probably most importantly, and it's probably often the weakest thing we do is how we manage communication, not just with uh, our clients, but how we manage communication within our own supply chains uh, and with our staff. Cash flow forecasting, I've actually included some good um, templates for you, but I can promise you all the major banks have excellent cash flow um, templates for you to use. But I, get, I guess the key thing that comes out of all the projects that I've seen is um, understanding liquidity and even the Irish case studies I've given you, very simple ways to understand, look, um, moving forward, what are my outgoings? What are my fixed variable costs? And the key outcome from all of them is coming up with a cash flow statement that needs to be done weekly and in fact needs to be done cubby for the next um, three months. And if there's anything that we need to start thinking about, once we've got our, our initial plan underway, and this comes back to contingency planning, how is that going to change with respect to removal of non-essential travel restrictions, which are already happening? How does the business plan need to react to the removal of interstate and travel? Hence the drive markets back again. What are the implications when we get more interstate and uh, moving particularly with domestic towards you know, the latter part of the year and what might be the implications for international. So I guess from a continuity perspective, it's saying that we, we can't just start planning for what's in front of us now. We've got to be thinking about what's happening with next month and the three months in front of that, if that makes sense. Marketing in comms, uh, again, and we'll look at some of our case studies here, has to then start looking at our audiences uh, this is where I guess we're going to talk about social media and, and the whole digital world that has been very effective for some operators, uh, but also the whole context of how we can work as a region in putting our messages out. And I'll finish this because I think the checklist is a worthwhile one just to step back and think about, well, okay, from my current plan, can I tick these items off as being undertaken? And the first one is, have I fully assess my current situation as an operator, particularly in terms of, of what the actions I can do, what I can no longer do, but what might be a timing sequence for when those actions or services that can be brought back in. Uh, have I, am I in control of review of all of my staff and their responsibilities moving forward? And more particularly, have I reached out to all my suppliers, uh, any future bookings, and how we start working together to up and cross sell, sell ourselves in the region. Um, have I communicated that with my staff and my supply chains? How am I going with my communication channels? Um, is the website up to date? And it's probably also just as critical to make sure that if you're still open and, and servicing market, is the right information available on the ATDW and other distribution channels, including uh, Google or TripAdvisor. Have you reviewed product and packaging opportunities? And we will look at some of the case studies in a moment of, about that. We might probably have a look at some of the work that Crystal Castle has been doing in terms of their online packaging and selling. Um, I don't know if no one's with us. Have you developed incentives of bookings? And I'm thinking here about that drive market that's now sitting in front of us um, for the next six to eight months. Have we started to think about how we can connect with that? Is that an RACV, RACQ, or other means of reaching out to those markets? Um, have we undertaken a financial analysis to determine survival milestones? So that comes back to your cash flow statement for the week, the month in advance, and three months in front of that in contingency planning. Have we assist critical business activity to identify opportunities? That's, that's probably the key one moving forward is, and I mentioned it earlier on, the industry that we inherit at the end of this is going to be very different, as is our consumers. So what are the sorts of opportunities that in fact lay before us in terms of packaging and services? 
and which fits into the last one, which is about assessing product opportunity or pricing. So it's very dry discussion, but those templates are critically important because it just gives you a prompt against your current business planning to say, do I have these things in hand? In a moment, I'm also gonna talk about insurance um, because unfortunately, you're gonna to have to continue to re revisit all of these items as you move forward. I mentioned before that it's not a linear sequence that we're going to be expecting in terms of growth and profiling. You're gonna find it to be very circular. And it's gonna be circular because the moment that we feel that we've got some control on our future, they're gonna change. And you're gonna find more information coming from Michael and the state government on what's happening outside. Whether that be a contingency issue in terms of um, clusters of further attack, or the fact that the market opens a lot faster than we expected. So that really is about contingency planning. So probably um, if I took a couple of case studies there, so if I was a retail shop, for example, um, what would the implications be for review of my current situation? That would also be the case if I was selling retail items, if I was a museum or an art centre. And if I even pick the top one, which is a vehicle or vessel tour, and you know, we look at what the issues that we're facing, Mike from Jetty Dive, and it's gonna face all of our operators, whether they be tour operators taking people in vans or buses, is there are gonna be capacity issues. If we can only put 30% of people on our bus, then there's gonna to have to be issues in terms of whether that's in fact worthwhile taking people out at all, or what pricing would need to be put in trying to allow that to happen. And that's exactly the issue that Mike faced in terms of his, his fishing vessel. If we look at the business continuity plan and we look at online retail options, um, again, Crystal Castle were very effective in being able to do three things. One of which was, and we talked about this at the major workshop that was recently held almost a couple of months ago, the critical ability to reach out to your known customers, to have your own profiling of your customers. Um, what Naren was able to do was to reach out to his existing customers. So he already had a data file. He was able to package up an online option for them. And then he was able to make sales on that online option in terms of the sort of products and services that he knew his customers were interested in. And he talks about them, I guess he talks about them as his tribe, um, so, and I think that's a very good way to look at it. Who are the key people that you need to keep close to uh, on your online options? We went through each of the human resource elements before, but what this case study is just starting to action is if I was an accommodation uh, outlet, it's no difference to the discussion that we've just had in terms of tour operators what's my minimal viable number of rooms that I need to have open and what are the implications of cleaning and hygiene uh, moving forward. So what starts to ask the question here of, well, gee, um, the cleaning is going to be an added an additional issue I need to manage. How many people do I need to run my operation and what's the staging and sequencing of how that works uh, for the next month, three months and six months. I think we've talked about cash flow forecasting because it's such a specialty thing. I think it's best that you use your templates that you've currently got from your, your banks and your accountants. But I would like to address insurance and compliance. Um, so what we, we know from the extreme weather events across Australia over the last two years, it's very difficult to just get insurance. If you're in a bushfire zone, it's almost going to be impossible. The Great Barrier Reef Resorts already are reaching a time where they're uninsurable. These are big issues for us as a sector and will continue to be so as we move forward. So it's not just a pricing of insurance, it's the fact that it's still available for us. So you do need to go back and have a look at and revisit uh, the elements of your public liability and workers' compensation. You need to revisit all your licensing and permits. We also need to have a look at, and I've yet to have a look at it myself, the implications of insurance on opening a business uh, and the sort of hygiene practices that you would need to have in trying to have due diligence, uh, appropriate due diligence and having a uh, operation that was able to invite people into and look after their health. There's a whole range of questions here that do need to be asked 
uh, particularly in terms of compliance. You could almost have a whole session on this. And perhaps through Michael, you know, we work with a lot of brokers who would be very interested, I think, Michael, to share some of their learnings in this because they are finding it hard to get insurance for operators. I'll keep moving because ultimately we, what we do know, Michael? I was just um, on the insurance issue. Have you, I've come across a couple of examples where people are struggling to claim under the current situation. Yep. Uh, at one stage, insurance providers were quoting the 1908 uh, Quarantine Act. Yep. Um, but through the business chamber, we were able to assist and have that rectified. Have you had any other consistent struggles or anything brought to your attention? All of the above. Um, we, we go through Gallagher, who are one of the biggest brokers, and, and Gallagher at least is someone you can lean on because in that instance, that's their role. The role is supposed to be looking after, in fact, um, the license holder as well as the people they're selling it to. Honestly, there's a liturgy. I could, there's so many issues that are coming up now in the context of fine line, how you read your and interpret what you're covered for versus how they would read it. Yeah, I think that's key, isn't it? Uh, there's so many different things coming out, but I guess it's finding that quality broker and one that you can trust is the key, is the first point, isn't it? I, I think so. All right, over to you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, okay, so previously we talked about the whole context of, um, you know, operationally what staff we need to have in, in order to service, but this really talks about how we're speaking to our clients. And I wanted to probably... Move it on, we'll go on to it. So what we, we do know is that digital is now more critically important than ever. Um, it's certainly more cost effective as a channel. Um, in this isolation period, you've got a whole new demographic of digital natives, my household being one of them. Um, so there's a lot to be learned in the context. And I think I talked about what Crystal Castle had done and how, but one, he needed to have his database and train first before he reached out to his customers and was able to successfully sell them products that they were interested in. But digital is where we need to be heading. I talked before about virtuality. This is probably more a state responsibility, but we've got to stay in travellers' minds even if they, they can't travel. They are dreaming while they're sitting at home. Um, so we need to give them some experiential content. Often that's through live streaming, and a lot of the states are starting to do this. Um, and so by default, it's a... Have a look at these experiences. I know, in fact, um, Crystal Castle do a little bit of this in terms of uh, the whole concept of wellness. Uh, so see it now and experience it soon is really selling to your next drive market when they can get away from their households. We need to re-segment priority travellers. And so from my perspective is if we, if we think back and go back to 15 years ago when we first were developing our drive market segments, you need to think about, well, who are those segments and how can I reach out to them? We know that they're going to be initially early family-based and VFR. A lot of people are reaching out and traveling back to families. Um, but ultimately we need to determine which segments are more viable and have greater spend and yield uh, for our businesses and which segments are going to need to rebuild that business over the next 18 months. So hence, uh, from a marketing and comms perspective, if it's drive, if it's a localised audience and you want to bring them back out, how are we going to reach out to them? What's the database? How are we going to boost our posts? Um, and online, what do we need to be able to do to start reaching out and getting some, some chatter going in terms of, of activity sets? We know that events are going to be limited for a considerable period of time, particularly in the number of people, even the markets, uh, that can successfully be achieved. Um, and I wanted to probably open it up for some discussion, but I wanted to finish with the fact that often we talk about the new economy moving forward, but these themes were with us before COVID, uh, the COVID uh, virus appeared, and they're still with us moving forward. So when we start opening up, our, the experience economy is still with us. The role played by big data is still critical in terms of how we reach out to people. Wellness and health are still with us. It now just carries with it a hygiene factor, um, which you might talk about a little bit more. New luxury is 
really more is less. So, and there's a whole heightened awareness now of, and I think some sensitivity about people being more realistic and not being seen as being overindulgent. It's going to be coming into a lot of our discussions. Regeneration we talked about uh, is really about how we give back rather than take away as we grow the industry um, in building more resilient destinations. So we talked about the experience economy, so that's still going to be with us. Uh, I think the difference is we want to sell it online first. So we want to actually stoke opportunities with your marketplace and then we want to bring them on and we want to actually deliver when they're in market. And what we did talk about last year was the fact that you, you do have the right set of products and experiences from an experiential perspective for that new drive market, but they have to be packaged and sold to that market. And we know that effectively we need to be really mindful of it's not just the, the Gen X and millennials, it's your touring market you need to start thinking about. And where are they driving to and where are they coming from? From a North New South Wales perspective, it's, they'll be coming from your regional centres and your big hub spots being South East Queensland. That's going to be particularly important for that half day drive, full day drive and extended weekend touring and for your five day loops. So immediately we need to st start thinking, okay, so what's my one to two day option? What's my weekend lo long weekend, three day option? What's my five day touring loop or, or whatever? A lot of this work's been done. It just needs to be brought back to market in the context of how it's sold and packaged. And as we talked about last year, so it's not so much the millennials, it's more the millennial alliance. So everyone needs to be part of the experiences they can purchase and market. And my perspective is at the beginning of my walks, when I come to Northern New South Wales, I always start the day looking like the guy on the right hand side, but really I'm feeling like the lady on the left. So, but I still want the same experience. That's in fact how I would see it. So we need to think about in terms of continuity planning and business planning and moving forward, what are the opportunities to position ourselves for the next six uh, to eight months, particularly for drive? And we need to start thinking about uh, the whole issue of wellness, hygiene and lifestyle. So cleanliness, cleaning and disinfectant is going to be part of our future, whether we like it or not. And that needs to cover us right across the supply chain. Um, and we work with operators across the world to do this. It just be, simply becomes a new procedural way of how we do our business. And I guess the key takeaway is that we do need to recognise the link between hygiene, wellness and the guest experience. Because if you don't, your guests certainly are going to be doing that. And they're going to be selecting their destinations on those that speak to hygiene, wellness and experience. And I'll finish with, I guess, the opportunities that both Michael and Jackie are quite critically aware of in terms of your own destination plan. Drive tourism has always been a core part of the market. It's just about to be revitalised. Uh, we can learn a lot from Europe in terms of slow food and slow travel. So the concept being slow down and slow the pace and spend money locally. We've still got our indigenous storylines and local produce. The politics of wellness are going to be mission critical in all of our destination management plans, both for locals and visitors. And we'll also have the innovative things that we do, sustainable fashion and design. Mindfulness is really part of wellness, but it fits into all of our retreats. And what we do have as, as a part of Destination North Coast is some crackingly good walks, whether they be park-based, beats or ocean fronts. This is the right time to send those to market. And if we look at the Swedes, and, and I'm gonna stop after these two or three slides for questions, this is how they're selling themselves well before COVID-19 was getting people to really take it slowly, get on bikes, stop the cars, get into the region, but do some traveling, sell them local produce. And the reality is that you've got very good produce right across um, the region to be able to sell them and package. So Michael, I'm, I'll open it up for any questions in terms of three phases that we face in any of the, the COVID-19 response that we might like to look at. 
Um, I'm going to kick off with one of my own to start with because I'm very interested in your viewpoint here, uh, Stuart. A lot of big, a lot of talk, and for very good reasons about uh, new themes, new trends of travel. People wanted to isolate more, etc. Um, but if you look at where the, the bulk of the capital investment is in our industry, it's in major products. Yep. Uh, just over the border from us, you know, theme parks, etc. They essentially need about five thousand people to be yep. profitable a day. The major hotels, they're not going to wait. Uh, they're going to be pushing every step of the way. How do you see the the big end of town reacting and pricing in the end? And then I, I see knock-on effects for the smaller part of our industry as well. Well, unfortunately, uh, where I see it is that um, they will not open at 30% occupancy. or uh, They will only open where they feel that they can start having... Um, it's going to cost them money to open too early. So... The feedback that I've got from major operators across Australia is that there's going to be a sizable lag until there's capacity for them to, to be worthwhile opening. That's a big issue for us because there are our iconic attractions. They drive distribution. And I think we've got some big issues of them coming online as fast as we'd like them to be. Yeah, I, I agree. And a huge employer as well. Um, Massive. Yeah, that's the thing. So it's this interesting one. I um, might just work through the, we've only had a couple of questions come through so far. Um, I'll just scroll through those. Uh, one, Margaret, about having captions added to ATDW. Uh, yeah. We can ask the question, Margaret, but ATDW moves very slowly <laughs> and tends to be at the pace at which they want to go. The captions on, on photos and images does not seem unrealistic. Um, Next one, what are the opportunities for destinations, councils, tourism associations to assist the industry recover? Yeah, well, I think um, this is where we've got to start working together. Um, tourism is an economic activity. And so to me, it needs to be then folded back into economic uh, revival. So, you know, I can't, we can't be separate from how we regrow our regions. And I think the issue there is um, I talked about uh, simple things like health and cleanliness. We need some assistance locally about what, what that might like to be, how that can be delivered and the training associated with it. We know that there are national guidelines, but I think what local government can help us do is just support operators because we can't do the heavy lifting. It's just, it's too hard to do the basics. Uh, the marketing, um, the drive markets, they're going to need their, their drive spots open. I do think the critical issue is going to be health and wellness. We can turn that into a positive. We're going to need some help to do that. Yep. Okay. Um, another one from Margaret. Uh, how do you view the importance of local networking and partnering with synergistic organisations for future marketing? Time poor organisations find it hard to participate in all the online resources being developed. Any tips? Yeah, look, I'm with you. I, I think um, this is, you know, one thing I did learn from speaking with Naren and Mike is, is that they, Naren does things very well, but Mike actually has got a good connection to his local community and with other operators. Um, and he, he wouldn't be surviving now if other people weren't supporting him in the network. So this is where your network's mission critical. So Mike's perspective was he knows a lot of people are coming to see him he's worked with simply because they know they want to support him. So it's that, it's that network that we've got to start fostering at a, at a local level. So Margaret, it's no easy ones on that, except that I think we've got to start reaching out. We won't do it by ourselves. Everyone's going to have to support each other in terms of not just packaging, but also helping each other, what, how better we can do our online marketing, for example. Yeah. Just adding to that as well, uh, you know, when we come out of this, I think you've touched on it earlier, Stuart, every major tourism organisation, destination marketing organisation, chains or whatever product, they're going to be flooding the marketing market with marketing dollars. So if you've got small budgets, you've got to really think about your spend. Think about, I'd be thinking first and foremost, if I had a small business, say 10 staff or less, what can I do for free? There's going to be a lot of money being spent. So how do I jump on the back on back of Destination New South Wales, Tourism Australia, everybody else's campaign. How do I leverage their work without reaching into my pocket? Because your pockets aren't going to be deep enough to compete with those guys. Um, and really kind of looking where you can leverage there. And then if you're going to spend money, you need to be thinking really, 
someone said it earlier in the piece, um, Ben from Destination Thinking, there's a line I've used a lot, focus, most on the, focus on those who love you the most. So think about your database, think about your core customers, think about your really core markets. It's not a time to be frivolous with your marketing, you need to be really targeted and really, uh, really strategic with your marketing. So I'd be leveraging everything I could that was for free making sure that everything I've got on, you know, meeting New South Wales on Destination New South Wales platform, Visit New South Wales, my whole online presence was as good as it's ever been. And then leverage, 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 I think is going to be key for a lot of businesses out there. Um, another one, uh, this one's about the care around and camping sector. It is going to be a huge opportunity. Completely agree with that. Uh, we'd love to work closer with destinations and other operators to promote this product and package tighter. It's a great opportunity to capture people in our area and increase length of stay. Any thoughts on this? Oh, 100%. To me, um, <laughs> it's, it's coming back. The issue for us, particularly for caravan parks, is just uh, you know, managing the expectations on social distancing. But the, mar the market is yours. Uh, and we know that people will be, they want to actually come to those activity sets. They want to go camping. And we also know, being honest about it, a lot of the market doesn't have a high discretionary spend because they've been doing it tough. So amazingly enough, you know, the, the biggest source market for you all is public servants um, and government because they've actually had their jobs through this period and they are an enormous opportunity to get out to the regions. So we need to be thinking a little bit left of field about how we do that. But I, I think in terms of the money available and the value for money, caravan parks and camping, 100%. Yeah. And in terms of working more with people, if whatever uh, local government area you're in, I'd be reaching out to the local uh, tourism manager at council, tourism association is the first point, be reaching out to Destination New South Wales and other organisations, making sure they're aware of you. And likewise, being you know, Caravan and Camping Association, being visible and being uh, well connected in that space, I think will pay dividends as we come through this because there'll be a lot of opportunity. Uh, next one, adding to discussion had earlier, um, how will Destination New South Wales address the corporate events plus the weddings and events market? The wedding industry is very much alone when it comes to marketing. And what we do today is binging uh, in business for su spring, summer next year. Um, I might just start on that one as I work directly with Destination New South Wales. I'm not sure what they're doing around the wedding space, but that's something we could endeavour to find out. But in terms of the business event space, they are corporate events, they are extremely active. The regional conferencing team, I think, has been one of the greatest additions to Destination New South Wales in some time. It's been integral in helping our Destination North Coast Business Events Program launch, and they provide a fantastic service to get connected. So, as I said before, if you are in that space, you, you absolutely have to have your business listed as a venue or a service provider on meeting New South Wales because it's free and it is the premier uh, location to go to for services in that space. Did you want to add anything there, Stuart? Uh, I think you got it in one. That, I couldn't value add to that. That's... <laughs> I thought I'd better answer that one as we are paid by the <laughs> um, When should destinations start reinvesting in events, business or other? Um, so what do we know about events? Uh, they, their lead times are completely different than the rest of the industry. So now now's when so because we want to buy events and in 12 months advance 18 months two years three years so that's our reality is that for events it's never um as a stop you've got to keep selling yeah uh next one's more of a comment doctors and nurses will definitely need a break i'm married to a nurse so i agree with that and some of us may need a break from them there we go <laughs> just saying it hope they can't hear me um <laughs> Weddings bring in a substantial amount of revenue that do not include co corporate events. Absolutely recognise there. We, are, we understand that weddings can be a little industry in themselves with all the ancillary services that they generate. Um, and then the final one we've got here, I would point out, as well as the caravan parks, also a great source of self-contained cabin accommodation. Not yeah. sure that the CP industry is not doing enough to promote this. Often more self-contained than motels and resorts. I'm sure the caravan and camping industry will be flogging that for all it's worth when yeah. they're able to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting one on the weekend. We had a bit of a, a local tourism managers meeting this morning. South Australia to see not only are they saying we're open, you can now do this, 
they were encouraging people to travel throughout the state and go caravanning and camping. That's the first proactive go out and do it message I've seen. So really important one. Um, that's the list of questions we've got here. Did you want to speak with uh, the businesses that you've been talking with or how do you want to move from here, Stuart? Um, look, you know, I think we tried to thread it in. I mean, the key thing about Mike was he just changed his business um, and it, it did come back to yield because he, he couldn't put people in his boats. Uh, and, and you know what, it, it's giving him cash flow. That's the, the critical component. Same for um, Crystal Castle was all about cash flow and being digitally orientated, but he had his database to work with. But he, he is selling his experience. So they both get the experience, but people do want the experience and they want it with an operator that they trust. Yeah, keep in front of mind, absolutely. Yeah. Um, question I have uh, as well when I've been, how's it going? Uh, actually, it's around communities. We've had this comment a bit uh, recently about how some communities have really enjoyed not having tourists. And there's yeah. a bit of a groundswell for that. Even though some of these communities have 25% of their population employed by tourism, they're still going, isn't this great? Well, you know, it's great when it's all been paid by other sources. Uh, any advice you have on, on people working in those kind of communities about maybe communicating the value of tourism or what they contribute? Well, you know, I, I see this as a national uh, discussion. So the Kiwis, are doing it really tough because they're an export country and um, they don't have any exports at the moment. There's no, no, nothing coming in and they're flat out getting their exports out. But that country is asking itself, do we really want to bring them all back? So, but, but they're smart. So what they're saying is, if you took 100% profile, what are the 40% we know which are good yield and let's, let's drive those markets because we want them back. What's the 30% that are marginal? And, you know, and what's the th last 30? Perhaps we don't want the last 30, which were our group and, and, and a whole range of other things. So I, you can turn it into a positive in that we want a high yield return. What we're going to find is for the next six months, we'll take everybody. We want, it, we want every mouth and leg back. But I do think that um, you're going to hear a lot of more about this word regenerative tourism. I think you can turn it into a positive, which says, we love you, we want you back, but on our terms, and we want you, we want your money in our economy, but we want to see it returning to the right people, and it's not just about volume. I think that's a positive, actually. I don't think it's a negative if, if we turn it into a positive, not a, we don't want you back here at all. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right regarding regenerative regenerative tourism, something I've got to learn how to say better. Uh, but just watching the emerging trends, you know, flight shaming and people yeah. hashtag train holiday in in Europe and UK and things like that. We, we need to provide people with an avenue to offset or to compensate or to rid themselves of guilt of their travel. And this is a good opportunity to build some of those things into the recovery. Uh, look, I, I said this last year, I think you guys can be Australia's leaders of a beautiful carbon sink, you know, so travel and then offset locally, you know, put it into plant, plant some trees or put it into local products because people, I think you'll find the new market, believe it or not, we've been talking about this for 10 years. The market has a consciousness, but it's been bloody well hidden for 10 years, but it, people will now start reconsidering what they're actually delivering locally and they want to be seen to be doing the right thing. I do think it's a big opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've had another comment in come in from Naren, who you've been speaking with during the week. I recommend if you're going to do one thing in marketing, start live streaming and or posting videos to Facebook. They don't need to be fancy or professional, just authentic. We stopped our normal Facebook budget completely, started live streaming and have reached half a million people since we closed our doors. And that's a lot more than usual. Was then asked, did you have a large uptake of membership? Yes, triple our goal. Great advice in there. And this is something I've seen multiple people and organisations, including like Tourism Australia, uh, try and communicate. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, Oscar winning productions. Authentic, real, real yeah. people, real stories is what resonates. And it has a great impact on people. Yeah. 100%. And people are thirsty for it. They really are looking for it. Oh, absolutely. And it's becoming, you know, especially with the younger traveller who they, they require that personal invitation, that personalised recommendation. Um, yeah. So very po positive there. Uh, got Destination New South Wales encouraging virtual experiences and get connected. 
for promotion via Visit New South Wales and social channels. Once again, guys, Destination New South Wales and Tourism Australia provide a, an amazing amount of free uh, platforms and connectivity. If you're not utilising them, you're doing yourself a disservice there. Um, okay, as we just hit 3.30, unless we have any further questions, we may have to wind it up there. I'll give people five seconds. Three. <laughs> Excellent. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you again for your time, Stuart. As always, you're a wealth of knowledge. Um, you can be very, very well in a very relatable fashion and um, always a great assistance to ourselves and people on the North Coast. So we'd like to thank you for that. Many thanks. My pleasure entirely. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Jay. Cheers. And everybody who uh, registered for this uh, presentation, we will share the presentation with you uh, following the call by email. Thank you very much, guys. For Thanks, guys. And um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.